Hey y'all, I'm wondering if folks came back on. Um, I'm back live again, sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, I really wanted to share uh, images from the collection. So that's what I'm trying to do right now and I think it's working. Um, so go ahead and comment if you're here just to say, hey. <clears throat> So I'm just going to be sharing some images from uh, the Clark Museum that I put together. Um, it seems like I can't exit the uh, slideshow that I made together and go back to the video for some reason. Uh, I was told that's how it worked uh, in a uh, workshop that I checked out, uh, but we're just going to roll with it and this is how it's going to roll. So um, hey everyone who's like tuning back in. Um, I'm Brittany Britton. I'm the curator and registrar for the Niels Hall collection here at the Clark Historical Museum. Um, I've been here for about a year and a half. I came on in August uh, 2018 and I was part time for a few months there where I was also working as a gallery assistant at Humboldt State. Um, and I uh, came back on full time January of 2019. So I've been here for about a year and a half. Um, in that time, I've gotten the collection, I've worked in the collection to get new exhibit spaces uh, more up to date uh, because one of our older, like one of our newest exhibits was maybe about five years old. So it was great getting, um, getting into the collection, creating new exhibits and just getting things like back up to speed, right? Um, and because of the fact that we're all working at home right now, I uh, haven't been able to visit the baskets. Um, so if folks don't know a lot about the Nealis Hall collection, we're based around uh, the tribes here in the Northwest coast of California. So it's gonna be Hoopa, Yurok, Kruk, Wiat, and a little bit of Talwa. They're our neighbors to the north. Uh, they kind of straddle today's Oregon, California boundary. They're mostly Del Norte County and then whatever that county is, Curry County, right? Like uh, up in Southern Oregon. <clears throat> so that's kind of the gist of our collection. It's based primarily around uh, basketry. Uh, so here's a look at our collection upstairs. I'm really sad that I couldn't do this uh, in person at the Clark. It probably would have just been overwhelming, honestly. But I'm really glad that I can share some snapshots uh, from my phone from the Clark. Um, so this is a view of our collection upstairs, and it's a view that a lot of people don't get to see, right? Like it's people who work at the museum, um, some researchers who get to see things upstairs. So like last year I had Dina Dodds, she's a Kruk weaver who works on the coast here and has won a number of grants through Humble Area Foundation and she's just fantastic. Um, she came by and wanted to look at uh, handles on large storage baskets and so I pulled out baskets that had everything to do with um, like handles and just beautifulness. Uh, another time she came and wanted to look at uh, um, basket uh, work hats. So you can kind of see that in that middle rack uh, with the these basket caps here that have they're more tan in color instead of that white kind of foreground color that's made out of bear grass. Um, so it was fun pulling all of those baskets for her and getting to um, kind of see how many work caps we even had. We had about 30. It was kind of wild. Like, I think if I had to guess, looking at the collection, it seems like sometimes I have to compartmentalize what kind of baskets we have, how many baskets we have. Um, just looking at the sheer number, this is one part of the room. Our basket collection is probably 20,000 items. I may be wrong about that. I'm, I think it's closer to that. So here's some other views of shelving at the Clark. The, the rolling wire shelves are really helpful because uh, then I can have more compact storage, right? It's like DIY compact storage for all you people working in museum spaces. Um, so here in the image on your guys' left, uh, these are uh, baskets made for the trade. Uh, they are uh, basket covered bot glass bottles. So there's flasks, uh, large kind of wine bottles. Um, I'm really glad I'm showing these images because I, I 
talking about baskets is one thing and being able to see them is a hundred times better. Um, this other image is me taking a selfie with uh, these fantastic uh, uh, ceremonial caps. And we have a wide range of caps. You can see some that the the foreground of the basket is more uh, with that red alder bark dyed woodwardia fern. Some are really heavy on bear grass. Some are just that white of the bear grass and the black of the maidenhair fern. Um, I got started talking about baskets and I totally went off tangent about where I was trying to go with this. But um, it's, it's incredible being with the collection. Um, another part about my background is that I'm a Hoopa tribal member. So I'm, I'm Native American, I'm from here. I grew up with some of these things in my household and in my life, but it's a whole other ball game to come into a museum collection and see the, this number of items from your culture and just seeing the br wide breadth of it. Um, I, I in, in the teaser for, for this talk, which I'm just blowing through right now, um, I, I had talked about like lessons to be learned from the collections. And some of those things are um, around the sheer diversity within our cultures here. So like just looking at the different design works, how these ladies and primarily our collection is woven by women. Like it's really easy to say like we have like 90% of the Nealis Hall collection was made by women because it's basketry and more women's kind of craft, women's traditions. Um, but just the sheer diversity of basket pattern um, and that not everything is the same. A cap is a cap with those three stages of design from the top, middle, and the bottom, but you can see just the sheer diversity across this simple art, the simple form, right? Um, I'm seeing Carolyn Beerley saying that they are so different yet similar to the Pomo collection at my site. I would love to see the Pomo collection. My father's uh, side of the family is from Kovalo. So he's uh, Konkau, Pomo, and Nomalaki. So it's, it's kind of great uh, getting to hear about things on my mom and my dad's side. Um, I keep getting caught up in all these images. So these are more images of storage. So on the left you have um, baby baskets. So I grew up having a baby basket. I know a lot of folks who are getting back into weaving. So today, so everything you're seeing in the collection is made today. Um, there isn't necessarily items that aren't being used and aren't being made today. Um, I would say more of the trade forms, so you're seeing that on the right, are maybe getting made less and less because there's not a necessity for weavers to be making for trade, um, like in the late 1800s to like the 1930s. Um, but baskets, baby baskets, those are the things that you're going to be seeing weavers working on, especially now during shelter in place. Um, I'm just seeing tons of basket starts on my Instagram feed from friends on the river communities because uh, they have time, right? They, can, they have time to go out to the rivers. It's easy to social distance on the river if you're gathering, gathering willow. Um, so it, it's been great to see the fact that this collection is a living collection in a way. These traditions are a living tradition and they haven't ended. Um, for all that, our area was colonized pretty late. So late 1850s or so um, was contact and we still survived, right? Like we're lucky in a sense, but there's also a strength and a resilience within the cultures in our community. And you could just see that in the collections, um, yeah. Um, and I think the next images are just uh, interesting baskets. Um, these are really just snapshots that I had on my phone that I dropped into a PowerPoint slide. <clears throat> so the larger basket on the left is more of a storage basket. Oh, any recommendations for us weavers to follow on social media? I think Dana Dodds is on Instagram. Um, Oh shoot, I don't know. It's kind of funny. It seems like other folks, they're not focusing just on baskets. It's like basketry is one part of their life. Like they'll show their kids, they'll share their cooking, they'll show whatever. I think hashtags that follow would be like very specific, like Yurok basket, Karuk basket, Karuk weaving, <coughs> Hoopa weaving. Um, but yeah, I don't know if Dina's on, on Instagram. If anybody has uh, folks that they want to tag in comments, that would be totally bomb. 
Um, but yeah, these are two different storage baskets. The one um, on the right hand side with the band of patterning, I think that's a Wiat basket. I wanted to include it in the Wiat uh, collection display that's in Neela's Hall, but it's far too large for the small narrow cases there. Um, we might have to end up uh, repurposing another storage case or another uh, display case to be able to show it in context. <clears throat> so, and these are really great. So these are um, the base of baskets if folks don't have that kind of uh, background. It's twining style as opposed to like pomos is more like coil, coil style weaving. And these are using maybe similar materials to pomo folks. Um, uh, it's gonna be sticks for the weft warp, for the warp, so the, the upright parts is the uh, willow uh, hazel sticks. And then for the weaver part, for the root, it's pine root, it's spruce root, it's willow root. <clears throat> and then the color comes from the overlaid material that the women would weave with, women and men would weave with. So white for the bear grass, black for maiden hair fern, <clears throat> red is alder bark dyed woodwardia fern, and then yellow is wolf moss or organ grape root dyed porcupine quills, but sometimes folks would dye bear grass as well. <clears throat> so I'm seeing folks being excited about seeing baskets. Um, what internal structures do you use to prevent collapse for the big ones? Um, in some cases we'll use in the museum for um, us storing these larger baskets, uh, kind of like how you're seeing up top here in the top of this image, these kind of snake uh, cotton batted filled uh, tubes. Uh, we'll coil those up on the inside and just be sure to um, kind of check it periodically because uh, so where we're at, we're on the coast, we have issues with um, with mold like straight up like we we have an intense relative humidity. Uh, so that's been a battle in our collections like organic materials. Uh, high humidity is not a very good combo. Um, so some of the some of the larger forms we've been shoring up with those kind of snakes. A lot of them, we're not seeing a lot of slumping um, from the baskets. The majority of these are about 100 to 120 years old. Probably these two are more like 110, 120 years old. And for whatever reason, our basketry from our area, probably because of the using sticks for that upright part of it, are strong and resilient. Seeing older photos of how basketry was displayed in the Clark Museum has, like you can see, we used to have just nails up the wall and like caps just hung on nails on the wall, right? Like there is a resilience to our baskets even, which is wild. So these are um, some, I'm just sharing fun snapshots. This is like a vacation talk. Um, so, on the left is the base of an overturned hopper basket. Those are the conical baskets that would go on top of grinding stones for acorns. Um, but this one has had added denim to the rim or to that lip so that it sits on top of the, the mortar. Um, and I, I thought it was just the coolest dang thing. And then these other two side caps the yellow is that intensely dyed, probably organ grapefruit for it to be that brighter yellow and that more intense yellow. And then the red that you see in the overlay of this other one, this is made by Amy Smoker. Uh, this is the one cap that I can remember who made it. I think it's from the 1920s. I may be wrong about that. And the red are this, uh, the little tear tabs from uh, cigarette packs. So she used this non-traditional material this non-organic material in her basketry that she just had. Um, and it, it's rare, that's rare in our collection. I've heard of other folks uh, using that in their basketry and using other materials. You'll see some things where they've used uh, dyed yarn to do the similar thing that we're doing with overlay materials, but that's pretty unique. Um, and that was on display in our, um, one of the cases downstairs that was uh, basket caps from the late 18th 1800s to 1920, so it was like going by year. So uh, just talking about sheer diversity of baskets here. So these are wall mats. They're about uh, six to seven inches wide, these two. Um, so they would be made for the trade. Uh, we had a really large uh, 
investment of basket weavers locally weaving for trade once like more Euro-American white settlers came to the area. Um, <clears throat> so the weavers to, ad to adapt to this new economy that was forced on them, like all of a sudden they needed to buy groceries, needed to buy clothing instead of going about their more traditional previous contact way of life, uh, would make baskets to sell. Um, the most well-known uh, trader of baskets in the area would have been Brazards. So that was the uh, kind of mercantile store that was out on the river communities. These women would go to Brazards, would say, I have these baskets, and then they would get um, money to use at the stores um, or for whatever they wanted to do. Um, but these are interesting in how different they are from each other. One is like so simple, like this lady did like 10 turns and she was done on the right, right? And this other one, it's more uh, invested in design. I like thinking about these these trays or these wall mats. Some people would use them uh, to put uh, hot pots on, like a, like a hot mat. Um, Others would just hang them on the wall. I'm, I grew up having these just hung on the wall. Um, I like thinking about them too because weavers could just whip them out in like an hour or more if they were like pro level and they were weaving for trade. I like thinking about them comparatively as uh, embroidery samplers that other women would make at kind of the similar time period. It was a way to work through ideas of design and a way to just kind of make just these interesting pieces that would sell. Um, beyond baskets, we also have uh, ceremonial regalia and other like decorative items. Uh, this is from an Instagram post I think I made when I first started because I was looking in the um, up in storage. We have a range of shelves and we also have a thing in our home location files called JB. I think it's just jewelry box. So it's a, a, a shelf with just a bunch of trays on it and or a bunch of drawers. And uh, these are just in there. It's like going through the most beautifulest indigenous jewelry box in a way. So up top, you're, what you're seeing are the ends of two hair ties. Um, these are mostly used uh, by women in uh, different ceremonial dances that they take part in. So brush dance um, primarily because uh, women would have their hair long, uh, long and flowing and not tied back like in jump dance. Um, and then these would be underneath the mink wraps. These would be at the end hanging down. So these are uh, wrapped bear grass, not braided bear grass, on these leather ties that have been split with um, naset, which is the Iraq kind of word for these small little clamshells. Might be wrong about that. I'm hoopa. So Iraq isn't my bag. But uh, that's what most folks today even just call these little clamshells. And then these glass beads. Um, so like glass beads and things like that, these other outside materials came from trade. Um, and then these are interesting for some of the other museum folks who are here. These ones, I had to kind of shore up some pieces of it because uh, it was getting glass disease. This was the first uh, example that I saw in the collection that had glass disease. And that has to do with the sheer amount of beads that were being produced in this time period. And they, due to the instability of the materials used or maybe the dyes, they just start to crawl apart and fall apart. Um, these blue beads, you can kind of see how irregular they are. There's a couple that were so fragile that I just kind of had to keep them in their own little tray. So beyond like mold and other like slumping of basket forms, we even have to worry about uh, the fact that these are mixed materials that all kind of need a different storage environment, which is challenging. On the bottom of this image, it's like a little tiny snapshot of a dentellium necklace with some parts that are incised. Uh, dentellium was the money on the river communities in the past. Um, in some ways it still is, especially if you uh, go to like the Klamath uh, Salmon Festival or out to Hoopa for the uh, for Sovereign's Days in August. Um, you'll see people gambling um, in a traditional way. And sometimes folks will still put up like the traditional bet of um, of regalia pieces or like dentellium strings of money. So I'm kind of sad I couldn't show my camera so I could show um, my dentellium necklaces that I made. Um, like part of the talk I wanted to talk about was I, so I'm a curator here and I'm a Hoopa Tribal member, but I'm also an artist. Um, being in the collections, it's changed my viewpoint on using my culture within my studio practice. 
Um, up until this point, probably in my MFA was where I finally had that turning point. Um, I didn't want to use my culture in my work or have to capitalize on it. And so it wasn't until my MFA and then probably even now um, that I felt comfortable kind of drawing on these really interesting forms and materials in my culture. Um, being at the Clark has actually shown me so much diversity and so much breadth of who, who and what the culture is from our area. Um, so, and this is actually a piece, this is actually a, a dress apron for um, the two-part regalia for women, which is the apron that goes around the waist and the front, and then the skirt would wrap around the back to meet in the front. Uh, this apron uh, doesn't have a corresponding part to it, corresponding skirt, it's just this. It's so heavy with those blue Russian trade beads. And then it has these bells up top, and then the rest is braided and wrapped uh, bear grass. So, um, oh, perfect, thank you, Katie. Uh, yeah, it has matching hair ties. Um, I took these detail shots mostly because these are details that maybe you wouldn't be able to notice in a museum case or like added to the fact that I, I get to spend, I spent a year and a half staring at these things. I, I really love the little leather loops at the base of these ties of each of these strands. It's just really beautiful parts. Um, so when I was growing up in uh, my ceremonial family, um, so I'm, I'm Hoopa, I'm from a dance family from Takamishting. And when it was time for me to take part in ceremonies when I was of age and I got asked to be part of the jump dance when I was like 11 or 12, uh, it was time for me to make my dress. And so we went around, me and my mom and my grandma, to look at dresses in the community so we could kind of get a better idea of uh, what my dress was gonna look like. And uh, we came to the Clark and I remember this dress. I wholeheartedly wanted this apron as my apron. Um, and I'm glad that my mom backed me off from it because we probably could have gotten enough of those trade beads. But if you've ever been to like uh, heartbeat or uh, talismans, you know how expensive they are? Um, but my mom was down, my mom was really down for it. Uh, but then she finally was like, D uh, you're a little girl, like I'm, I'm very slight. I never grew hips, right? Um, <laughs> I probably would have fell over if we made my apron this way. And I'm glad <laughs> in hindsight that my dress ended up not looking like this. Um, <laughs> uh, so in here's uh, some more photos of me taking care of the dresses here. Um, this is another apron that doesn't have a corresponding skirt. Oh, what does it mean to be in a dance family? I just saw Katie's question. Um, so uh, I am from a dance family, which means my family is responsible for putting on particular ceremonies in our community. So I am from, so my uncle, my grandmother's brother, my uncle was Merv George. So he was our dance leader um, up until he passed a uh, year before last or last year. Um, time is kind of wild right now. But uh, so I, I grew up with, with the dances as something I did every other year in the community. So we were responsible for putting on the jump dance and putting on the deerskin dance in, in our area. So we were one camp of one side. Um, and it, it it was great growing up in that. And I didn't think of it as if it was different or special or anything. It was just a thing we did. I even got to grow up with my great grandmother who was our uh, medicine woman who uh, started all of this, or not started, but she, she had her role in these things. Uh, Rudolf Soktisch was uh, my uncle. So yeah, so I'm like, I have this unique viewpoint, I guess. Um, I don't think we have a photo of my dance dress, uh, which is too bad. Um, I do have a Polaroid. I probably should just scan that for the museum and just add to that so that we have more of these images, even from like, I don't know, the early or the late 1990s, right? Like, when do we stop collecting? Um, it would be neat to get those kind of images because people have them of like I even have images of like my mom went to like a photo studio god it might have been Sears to get uh, a photo of her in her dress <laughs> so anyways so uh, so part of this 
is me taking care of the collection, uh, which sometimes means that I have to dig out past insect infestations in the pine nuts that are in this apron, uh, which is what this image is of. So it's me dusting and kind of getting um, kind of accretion of material, whether it's uh, from its lived life out in the world or if it's accretion of material like dust and things like that from it just being in storage. Um, and this was a little tiny apron. I think this might be the apron. So with the collection, we have a number of aprons that are what I've been calling orphan aprons. Um, they came into the collection just as objects. Um, you'll see in old Brizard's photos, just uh, there's that iconic Brizard's photo uh, that is a photo of Brizard's uh, with all of these baskets. And then you'll see a couple random dress aprons just kind of hung up. For a lot of people who were, <laughs> who were, um, uh, purchasing these items as part of the uh, arts and crafts movement, especially, they were just pretty things that they could put into their house. And aprons are beautiful, um, but they didn't need the full dress. So they would just purchase the apron separately and then the dress would be split up. Or sometimes the apron would be just made for trade. So a lot of them came into the collection. We don't have a lot of good provenance information on the dresses or the aprons for whatever reason. And we've done research over the over time beyond like the past curators, past museum staff, us digging through notebooks and things like that and trying to figure out where these came from. So like right now, uh, this apron, I think it's from the Herrick collection, it's the one I'm thinking of, uh, was donated in X, X year and it's an apron. There's not even a tribal affiliation of who it, whose it was, whether it ever danced. Um, so. As a part of that, one of the main projects that we started uh, this last year with uh, generous funding help from the Seroptimists locally uh, to help purchase materials is that we're gonna make a new skirt for the back of this apron. Um, there's no matching apron or even another one in, or another skirt uh, in the collection that could even kind of be merged together with it, uh, with the ultimate goal of this apron will have a matching skirt and then this dress, this full dress will be able to go out for ceremonies to fulfill its living purpose. Um, locally, our viewpoint of baskets and regalia, they are living things and they have a purpose. They were made for a purpose. This apron was made to dance and it should be dancing. Um, full stop. So today we are making this, this skirt that's gonna go along with it. Um, you can see more about that. I think it's on the blog. If not, it will be posted by this weekend. I'll be finishing that up. Um, and it, it's just a really fun project for the museum to take that stance of this object came in, is unfulfilled, and it needs to be completed. And we're doing this with partnership with uh, the Nealis Hall Committee. So beyond my being the curator there, there is also a advisory committee that is here at Nealis Hall, made up of interested, um, invested Native American community members. We try to have a breadth of uh, people representing all tribal backgrounds in our area, um, as well as having a balance of men and women. Um, and so they've been really helpful in spearheading this project. First and foremost is Shirley Laus, who is our board president, who is a Trinidad Rancheria tribal member, and Rachel Sundberg, who is also a Trinidad Rancheria tribal member who is on the museum board, but also chair of the Nealis Hall Committee. Um, and I, they've given invaluable, like invaluable support um, to this project. Um, mostly it's gonna be a lot of cleaning pine nuts. <laughs> and Jerry Hale, one of our board members actually uh, from, I think it was a deer he shot, um, he got the hide tanned for us and donated it to us. Um, so it's coming together slowly little bit slower now that the pandemic has closed us to the public but it's it's happening it's happening on museum time right like change happens slowly uh, one of the other projects that I've been doing that I kind of picked up so you could see this text along with this fantastic basket cover bottle by Minnie Reed um, was I just started doing this on my own um, Instagram page and then I brought it over to the Clark page and kind of revived the Clark Instagram feed um, it's called basket of the day, hashtag basket of the day, um, where I just share snapshots of basketry that is upstairs in our collect storage collection area that they maybe haven't been on display in a number of years. They probably aren't ever going to go downstairs in any 
next year or so. And so I'm showing things that like just haven't been seen. Um, and it's a way to share a little bit more background on the pieces. So I will show multiple views of the object um, and I will share a, a video of me holding it and rotating it 360. Um, so that you can see the interior, like for this basket bottle, I would have taken the lid off and would have shown the bottom of it. This is kind of an odd snapshot of it. And I'll share information about the weavers. Um, it's been uh, fantastic to see how much interest has grown in, in, that, uh, in that project that I kind of started as a one-off. It was just a thing that I did for myself to share with my friends. And then I realized like, oh, I could share this with everybody else too. Um, it's been really fun. Um, yeah, and it, it's, I'm hoping, and I'm just trying to start it, uh, folks on the main hall side to also do Artifact of the Day. It's so like for all that Mila's Hall has these millions of baskets, it feels like, or thousands of baskets. Uh, the main hall side has countless photographs, teapots, baby carriages, hats, just if you have it in your house, we probably have it too. Um, and so just being able to show more of our collections to the public that are outside of exhibits has been um, part of my goal um, and making our museum collection a little bit more uh, accessible. <clears throat> um, in regards to exhibits, um, one of the first things that I had done when I started here was swapping out the Becker case. So this is the large case that when you first come into Neelis Hall, it's off to the right hand side. Um, I focused the exhibit on women's regalia, um, mo trying to share more of our dresses um, from the collection. Um, so what you're seeing on the left hand side is me taking the plywood from this mural that we had um, and painting the back side of it with just this really the simple uh, snake nose pattern. Um, so I did two of these to kind of ground the space because we, we just straight up didn't have funding to change out the background fabric in this case. So this was a way to kind of, uh, kind of zhuzh the space up, right? Um, and then on the right hand side is the installation view of the exhibit. So in the foreground is a apron by Ina Faustino, Ewok Ina. Um, it's a, a multi-strand, um, so these aprons originally were constructed by folding the leather into thirds and kind of sandwiching them and then cutting them into fringe. And then you can see where they gathered small sections of it, did bigger, thicker wraps, and then thinner wraps and broke those out into just those thinner single pieces that were then wrapped in bear grass, had bear grass braided around it. And then that middle dark section or, um, ooh, I always forget which one it is, juniper or cedar berries. Um, and then mixed in there are these little tiny clamshells. There's even like a bird bone. Um, it's a really, really beautiful apron. And I think it'll still be up whenever we end up reopening to the public. Um, and then the next dress down is a um, older kind of smaller girls dress. Uh, we actually had the pleasure of being able to loan that out to Trinidad Rancheria to actually Shirley Louse's granddaughter, Isabel, who is one of our uh, youngest uh, junior docents. Uh, so she'll come in, You'll, if you've been to the museum and come by on Arts Alive, you'll see her uh, kind of leading folks around on tours. Uh, she's fantastic. But she uh, got to wear the apron or got to wear the dress, that particular dress at a dress walk that they had at Sumeg for I think Sumeg Village Days, maybe two years ago. And so I had some really sweet photos of her wearing it. It was her first time taking part in a dress walk and she was very proud to be able to wear a dress from the museum. She, uh, if she's given you a tour, she's probably taking you to that dress and said that it's my dress <laughs> because she has such a tie to it and I can't wait until she gets older and then takes this job, right? <laughs> and the further back, um, I'm sad I didn't include a larger photo now that I know I can't uh, switch to video view. Um, you can see these little pink outlines. Uh, those are uh, suitcases. So I included suitcases in the exhibit to kind of talk to our own, when I'm talking our own, like I'm a, if, if folks tuned in later, I'm, I'm Hoopa, like uh, I'm an indigenous person locally. Uh, so. 
other folks will be will understand and remember and see, remember seeing this growing up. Uh, we store a lot of regalia in uh, these really vintage suitcases, right? Like really nice hardback Samsonites. But I found these beautiful um, pink suitcases, and I wanted them in the exhibit to kind of talk to other Native people who are coming into our exhibit space. Um, my main curatorial goal with Nealis Hall is that this museum is at once, uh, this museum collection is at once here to educate non-native, non-local people, or even locals uh, about the indigenous cultures locally. And at the same time, I want it to be there for indigenous people coming in the door to be able to learn something about themselves or just seeing themselves represented in a meaningful, wholehearted way. And that's the sole reason why I have those pink suitcases in the exhibit. Um, I remember having a, like this big, kind of ugly, like I wish I had those cute pink suitcases, um, big ugly Samsonite that I had my regalia in. And it's just a way for you to transport it to ceremonies. Um, and it's a good way to store it. It's not gonna get banged up. <laughs> And um, it's more funny, so like at the far end, you can't see any images of it, but we have images on our website at clarkmuseum.org, um, probably under blog or under exhibits uh, for the women's ceremonial dresses. Part of the exhibit's goal was to, beyond including our older collections, was also borrowing uh, women's dresses from the community. So we um, set out to borrow current made, like in the last five or 10 years, dresses. Part of that, the first dress we borrowed was from Libby, who is over at um, the Indian Center in Hoopa. So they had a dressmaking program two years ago. Um, and I think it's still ongoing. There were like three running at the time in, in Hoopa Valley between the museum, archives, um, TANF, and Indian Center. And so she was making her first dress. She was young, she's like a teenager. And she, I got to borrow her apron. She was done with the apron. She was still working on the skirt. And I had these really great photos of all the girls uh, gathering, um, gathering bear grass, gathering pine cones on the side of the highway, going out to Weaverville, right? Um, them bashing the pine nuts open, or the pine cones open, and then them sitting there bored grinding pine nuts and realizing how much work goes into this. And the fact that these girls were dedicated to this project. This is gonna be their dress that they're gonna wear for their ceremonies. And the fact that like, it's this intense continuum of late 1800s, early 1900s dresses to dresses made here in the 2010s to the 2020s, right? Um, so throughout the last year, we get we borrowed dresses from Weyot Tribe. We borrowed the dress that Michelle Hernandez wore in the first uh, 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 coming of age, women's coming of age ceremony for Weyot's since pre uh pre the 1860 massacre, right? Um, and it was beautiful. Like, I'm so happy that we got to share it. And they were all very different. Like every single one of these dresses were different from each other. Um, the cut was different. The materials chosen were different. Um, people who might have tanned their own hide, people who purchased hide, people who purchased glass beads, people who purchased already shaped abalone, to people who got abalone out of the ocean and cut it and shaved it themselves. There is no right or wrong way to make these dresses. Um, beyond Michelle, we also uh, borrowed a dress made through the cultural program at Trinidad Rancheria, which was beautiful. Um, I'm going to say everything is beautiful. To me, this 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 project was was wonderful. Um, and then the last dress that we got to borrow was from Marlette Grant Jackson, who works over at ITEP at HSU, and it was a very different dress. It had these beautiful chartreuse beads with this netting across the skirt, and then the apron itself was beaded with the chartreuse beads, clamshell discs, and more. And images of that are up on um, the exhibits page, actually, on the clerk museum page. <laughs> so I'm ending with this image. Um, this is me cleaning a basket. Um, this is one of our largest storage baskets. I had to get in there because there was an insect infestation, a, a past insect infestation that was at the bottom of the basket. And there, it was impossible beyond me clipping a light to my beanie and just straight up crawling inside of the basket. Um, <laughs> I forgot this was the image. So this is uh, one of our largest baskets in the collection and it is human sized, right?
So, and it's, it's been wild. Like I'm, I'm excited that I got to share these images because it's been, um, we've been closed for about a month and I've been working from home for close to the same, probably about three and a half weeks. We uh, kind of finished up stuff at the museum mid to end of March. And then we worked from home after that. So being able to see these images has been really fantastic um, because I, I, I miss my, I miss the baskets. Um, and part of that, is I'm going to do my stump speech now, um, is being able to um, know that once we can finally reopen, we can actually open our doors. Um, so if if you have the cash, if you got your stimulus check, right? Um, if you would like to continue these projects, uh, we have a donate button here on the live feed. We also have um, under clarkmuseum.org slash memberships. If you want to uh, get a membership with the museum, um, we have uh, one-time uh, donations that are uh, $25 for one time for seniors and students, the current current students who are enrolled, $55 for family membership, and then a $100 patron membership that gets you um, reciprocal area um, entry to museums, so places like the Morris Graves, but also uh, through the National American Regional Museum Association. Uh, Rome and NARM are the name of the uh, of the programs. Uh, we have a reciprocal agreement with other museums across the United States, and a lot of them are in the Bay Area. If you ever, if, once we open our doors, um, again, uh, it's the Asian Art Museum, the De Young, the um, just really big name museums that you can get access to, and even other small ones. Like I think the Grace Hudson Museum is involved in that too. Don't quote me on that. Uh, check out the Rome and NARM um, listings that are also under membership. I think those are clickable links. We had a uh, really fantastic uh, volunteer, Nanette, uh, who I can't wait until she's back in the museum, uh, who just basically went across the United States from our area to the Bay Area and then drove to Oklahoma and hit like, I don't know, like 50 museums and her museum membership paid for itself. Um, like even just one trip to the Bay Area would pay for itself with a patron membership. Um, I highly recommend it. I'm totally going to buy one. Um, we, yeah, so we're, we're grateful for whatever you can give. Um, and we, we look forward to you becoming part of the Clark Museum family in some manner, whether it's volunteering in some way, we're always looking for volunteers. Um, probably not right now necessarily until we work up some potentially, uh, remote projects that we could give to folks um but yeah we we miss everything we miss the museum we miss having people in there um that's that's about where i'm at oh nanette will be back for friday night markets if if and when friday night markets happen um so I, i'm i'm gonna click back to another image that's really neat um and so I have time. I kind of like talked myself out. Does anyone have any other questions? Otherwise, I could just ramble. I'm good at that. <clears throat> oh, I know. I could give the follow up. Uh, so this is a every Friday thing that we're going to be doing on Facebook Live. Um, so upcoming uh, Friday Facebook Live events are so next Friday, April 24th at 2 p.m. Same time, same place. Alex, our new registrar, is going to be discussing the important role that the registrar plays in the operation of the museum. Um, she works on the main hall side primarily, but will also be working um, with Neelis Hall. Um, May 1st, Friday, May 1st at 2, is Dina. She's a volunteer school tour docent. She'll be discussing the centrality of yearly school tours to the museum's lengthy history of being a publicly accessible learning space, and also some funny moments from leading groups around the museum. May 8th, Shirley Laus, also possibly Rachel Sundberg. We're still figuring that out. Um, she's our board president. She will be sharing about her role at the museum, so the work she has done as a board member and a volunteer. And that like totally doesn't encompass everything that Shirley does. If you've ever been to Arts Alive, she is always doing a basket material demonstration here at the museum. Um, and she she's a fantastic and dedicated volunteer. Um, May 15th, we'll have Lynn, who is our board vice president. Um, she'll be sharing her experiences on the board and her work as a volunteer docent greeting visitors from around the world who have come to the museum to come to visit the museum. Um, that is kind of a, a fantastic part. 
beyond our having local folks come in and all those school tours, like probably a lot of the locals who are watching have come through the museum at some point at a school tour in fourth grade, right? We get the entirety of the county's fourth grade in every year. Um, what I didn't realize until I started working here was just the sheer number of humans that come through the museum who aren't even from here. Like they are from England, they're from Germany, they're from Japan, and they're here to come look at Humboldt County. Um, and they come to our museum and learn a little bit about our history and kind of get a context for this region that they are, that they are visiting. And not just, and the, and the best part about the Clark, I feel like, is that we're not just giving like the settlers point of view, right? About Humboldt County, we're also strongly including that Native American voice of the indigenous communities that are from here. Katie's asking, what would be a dream exhibit for you to host in Nealis Hall? Um, and it's something that, so Katie's our interim director, um, <laughs> and also previous curator of the main hall. She's not a, a random audience member, I'm telling on her. Um, a dream exhibit that I want to host for Nealis Hall, which might be a dream right now because we're not open. We had our scheduled, um, and I'm going to ruin it. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm hyping it. We're, we had a scheduled um, exhibit for the summer uh, that was just going to be fishing. Um, that was going to be a joint exhibit between Nealis Hall and the main hall, um, which would be new for one of the first times. Um, for the longest time, the two halls have stayed very separate. Um, on the Nealis Hall collection, stay in Nealis Hall. The main hall collections primarily stay in the main hall. And I've been kind of having some bleed over um, between the halls. So like using um, some stuff stored from the main hall, like uh, there's an etched glass stein that has a basket pattern on it and some like t-shirts and things like that. They're housed in the main hall that have basket patterns on it that I have used in, hi, I blew your cover, Katie, um, that I've used in, uh, in, in the When Designs Escaped Baskets uh, exhibit, um, and then some quilting in the baby basket uh, exhibits. But so the goal with the fishing exhibit is and was and is uh, to get the canoe from Nealis Hall into Main Hall and really blend the two spaces together. Um, with fishing, we can talk about settler communities, we can talk about indigenous communities, we can talk about how we are sharing our waterways together from contact to today. Um, if you hear anything about water rights, it's going to be Native Americans and it's going to be farmers who are probably non-native. Like we're all in this together in a way and like that's a unique lens to be able to look at our history that is messy and beautiful and just like hard working. So beyond a range of more traditional fishing implements to like contemporary modern nets, right? Like I'm dreaming of when I can try to steal Almy Allen, right? To come do a net hanging workshop and then even do one about like, I don't know, crab pots and sustainability of the bay. Um, it's a really unique space to be able to do that. And I, I dream about the moment when we can blend the spaces. Um, instead of it, so like <laughs> part of it is I'm attacking and really addressing comments that I'll hear. So like uh, the storage space is upstairs um, above the exhibit space. Every once in a while, probably every week, maybe, maybe every other week, I'll hear a comment of just, oh, it's such a shame these Indians don't exist. Um, and it's coming from, from a space of this really drilled in stereotype that Native Americans don't exist, right? That, oh, it's such a shame, they're just all gone. Um, when like they are standing near a person, right? Who is Native American and whose history continues. So that's been the entire goal of Nealis Hall of to address and continue our culture, right? And to show that we are still here, we're still doing our thing and we're gonna keep doing our thing. <laughs> I'm seeing Carolyn's comment. <laughs> oh, fantastic, you used to be a volunteer. That's really fantastic. Oh man, it'd be really great to do connections down to Lake County. Um, and it's great hearing um, so many folks had been a part of the Clark Museum family. Um, another thing that I forgot to mention was my educational background because um, I just launched right into basket time. Um, uh, so I, uh, beyond growing up locally, I went to Humboldt State University and I got my Museum and Gallery Practices certificate there. Um, and I interned at the Clark for it actually in 2011. Um, so I just didn't get brought in as some ringer uh, to work in the Nealis Hall collections. I uh, 
I was, I, I have uh, an experience here and it's really funny um, using our uh, collections management system, Past Perfect, seeing my old notes of going through the collections uh, from 2011 when I was an intern is just hilarious. Um, but yeah, so I, um, I'm, I'm happy that I got to come back to the Clark um, and just to get see, to see all my favorite baskets. <laughs> Pat says, I would really love to see lots more blending between the two exhibit spaces. I agree. I think it's uh, an ongoing goal that I want to continue um, and I want to see happen, right? Um, I'm, I'm sad that, I'm not sad. I'm excited that I my time there has helped build a foundation for us to be able to do that. The majority of the collections hadn't been swapped over. A lot of the work had been to change out so like a lot of the stuff that's changed has been the hover case. So we did this huge redo in January when we were closed for our regular closure, not this pandemic closure. I uh, pulled all the baskets from the case, cleaned the case, pulled carpet from the walls of the case, scraped down the carpet glue on the case and repainted it and reinstalled the exhibit and made new signage for it. Uh, the back exhibit space used to be the Hailstone Collection exhibit that was up for five plus years. And that is now uh, When Designs Escaped Baskets, which was an exhibit focusing on uh, basket patterns and designs uh, across uh, basket types and talking about very like similarities of pattern and where they kind of come from and names amongst them. Um, and even looking at how like today, like back in the day baskets, uh, these patterns started on baskets and today they are everywhere including baskets, right? You'll drive down the road and see just like these beautiful car decals in Snake Nose or in Obsidian Blade. And you'll see it on shirts, you'll see it on water bottles, just people cutting decals all over the place. Beautiful tattoos and things like that. Like our, our culture has escaped our traditional items and it's been a way to preserve our culture. Um, we talked about the Becker case at length, talking about the, the women's ceremonial dresses. Um, I even redid the the diorama, the large open air case that for the longest time had those two uh, mannequins that were in the case. Um, so now it's an acorn display uh, that was built specifically for our school tours. Um, so it's from gathering the acorn to storing the acorn to processing it into meal that you could cook to one that, and to how folks traditionally ate acorns and still eat acorns. Um, but yeah, it's, I'm looking forward to the future of like what kind of work like people after me build onto this time that I've had here. I'm, I'm excited for the future and I'm excited for whenever we get to reopen. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful that uh, you all came and kind of listened to me ramble about these baskets. Um, and it's, it's been a fantastic gift that I'm glad I get to share with the community and with this internet community, right? Are there any other last questions? We have about two minutes. <clears throat> this large uh, basket is another uh, storage basket that has this kind of unique uh, uh, running pattern around the, around the circumference. So it's a um, kind of uh, design in friendship but with this worm trail inside. Um, and then it's funny, you could see how it kind of, like the weaver would have to weave these really large stitches, right? To see, to be able to make up the pattern. Anyways, folks, um, I'm gonna log out and end the live video soon. Um, thank you for coming. Um, if you need to contact us, do through the clarkmuseum.org and uh, leave us a note. You can even message us here on Facebook, on Instagram, and we also have a Twitter feed. Um, thank you all for being here and listening to my basket ramble. Um, I'm thankful that you all attended this talk. Thank you again. Sadia.